think we should start. Okay. Um, if that's okay with everybody. Um, I, just, I doubt there's some extra people will join as, as, we, as we get going. Um, so this is uh, the second in our Blue Skies Green Future webinar series associated with the Transforming the Foundation Industries Network Plus. Uh, there'll be others. Um, uh, there'll be one next month, then we'll have a break over the summer, then this series will start again in September. And we'll have some, uh, the idea of this series is to, is to invite uh, world-class researchers along, and Clive, <laughs> um, to give us a nice uh, talk on, on, on the uh, subject um, or one of the topics that they do. And um, the idea is to introduce more disruptive technologies that could uh, lead to significant uh, uh, changes in how we manufacture basic materials, or in our case, how we impact on the foundation industries, uh, which are really the big manufacturing industries in the United Kingdom, your metals, glass, ceramics, and so on type industries. So I will introduce Clive. Uh, I've known Clive for, um, oh my goodness me, 1987 was when we met 30, I can't know, 34 years ago. So that tells you how old I am, more or less how old Clive is and how long we've known each other, obviously. Um, he's the Distinguished Professor of Material Science and Engineering at the Materials Research Institute at Pennsylvania State University, um, which is a really beautiful campus if you should ever go. It is uh, one of the most beautiful campuses of, of all the uh, the um, bigger 10 universities in the US for sure. Um, he's a Brit, oh, uh, he's now a naturalized American, but he comes from the United Kingdom, has a BS uh, in uh, BSc honors uh, from uh, East Anglia University and did his PhD at the University of Essex in the Department of Physics where we first met. He was the director of the Center of Dielectric Studies, which became the Center of Dielectrics and Piezoelectrics ultimately. He took that mantle up in 1997 and he drove that uh, center to be one of the most important uh, centers for the study of uh, capacitor materials uh, and general dielectric materials in the world, interacting with many of the major companies, um, the Sonys, the Mitsubishis, the Muratas of this world, all are members of the, the center. Um, his interests are very, very varied. He started like me out as, as a microscopist, but got uh, very interested very early in processing. Uh, and I think we both have a love of processing, uh, which isn't necessarily always the, 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 uh, the thing that gets you the most attention, but really is, is the heart of, of, of driving materials to go out towards industrial applications. Um, He's the, he has been, he's, the, are you current of the IEEE Distinguished Lecturer, uh, Clive, is that current? I, I think because of COVID, we're, uh, I, I'm basically in hold, yes. All right, so, he, so he's, he will be and is uh, the IEEE Distinguished Lecturer uh, and an honorary fellow of the European Ceramic Society. He has an embarrassing number of uh, citations uh, and um, a H factor of 85. So those of you who know what H factors are, that is a colossal number. So I'm going to pass over to, uh, to Clive now, who's going to give a talk on the function of the cold sintering of functional materials, and I'll allow him to introduce the topic. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all the participants for joining. Um, I, I hope everybody can hear me. Um, um, the, um, sometimes the microphones are need replacing on some of these older computers but as you know there's a world shortage of chips and I just found out yesterday that getting a laptop will take me nine months more because of the world shortage of chip in the United States which is interesting. So um, yeah I, I, let me talk a little bit about the Institute. Uh, the building that you see here is the Millennium Science Complex. My office is on the second floor of this and um, I'm the Institute Director for Materials at Penn State which has like 300 and 320 faculty in it, which interacts with something like uh, 27 different departments and seven different colleges. So there's a broad network of materials activity at Penn State. Um, 
Um, some of the things that we do, I mean, the normal university structures, as you know, goes from basically in silos, such as colleges, departments with the deans. At Penn State, we've got a very different model of where I and four other colleagues with other institutes run normal to that particular group. So our job is to drive interdisciplinary research. And Penn State has already had a long reputation of interdisciplinary research. Some of you may or may not know that the foundations of the Materials Research Society came out of the work of Rustam Roy here back in the 1970s. So it goes back a long time, uh, that, that culture. And, um, and so it continues um, and it continues to thrive at Penn State and in particular materials, we've seen large growth over the last five or six years. Um, in that time. A couple of things I want to point out is that we're very focused at the moment on industrial partnerships. So I'm very, very glad to join this network um, and glad to see that the UK universities are also expanding and looking to transition their fundamental work and push up the TRL levels um, with the partnership of, of companies. Um, accelerating uh, the tech transfer process needs communication and partnership for sure and education across not just the academic educational part, but also with vocational schools. And so we're also looking for those types of connections. And um, the way the institutes operate is that we have strategic plans. I'm just highlighting uh, the, the consistency of, of why I'm very happy to join this, uh, this particular presentation. You know, um, this is our next five years of, of strategic areas, um, advancing material synthesis, developing sustainable materials manufacturing, and optimizing translation for materials discovery are three of the seven goals that we have over the, uh, over the next four, uh, five or six years. And I just heard this morning from my boss that my budget was approved to doing all of this, which is great because it means that we'll be hiring at least another 25 faculty to support these areas. So I'm in a very good mood this morning. Um, also within Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania is um, one of the industrial hubs and has, the his, in, has, had, has the history of that, you know, just like Sheffield, we had the steel city of Pittsburgh, um, but we have a large number of, of companies distributed over the Commonwealth and the population of Pennsylvania is around 12 million. So it's like a little small country, but um, um, but quite large. Penn State actually sits right in the center of here. So Philadelphia is over here, Pittsburgh's over here. We are in the middle of nowhere. We are right in the Appalachia. Um, and um, that is both good and bad, but um, 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 we've still managed to attract and Typically we work, MRI, the Materials Research Institute, works with over 170 companies per year in terms of this. And um, over the last five years, 100 of them have been within the state of Pennsylvania. And you can see that they are international companies and across all domains of materials, from building materials to um, biomedical materials to plastics. Um, so over the last um, six years, um, we've grown our federal grant awards from 80 million to now 172 million. Um, we are ranked um, number one and number two from the National Science Foundation in terms of expenditures, um, number one in materials and number two in material science. It's interesting, you know, we have to always justify everything by, by metrics uh, these days. But a very fascinating one that we've been tracking since I've been director is the activity on the website. We, we revamped the website and now we have over 1.4 million um, views per year of which the average time on our website is like two minutes per page, which is just outstanding. And, and these are all outside, um, outside users, not internal users to Penn State. Okay, so that's that's enough sort of background. It, it, it basically gives me lots of excuses for why this talk may not be the best talk that you've ever heard because um, um, this is my hobby. Uh, I still have a research group of about 16 people, but, um, but my main focus is on this other 300 plus faculty uh, and trying to help them to be successful. As Ian said, we have a beautiful campus 
it's not always looking like this beautiful. It's now looking like this because uh, spring has just arrived in Pennsylvania. So it's very fresh green. Okay. So about 2014, um, um, after reading some work, work in the geological literature, we started thinking about sedimentous rock and thinking about could we make ceramics like this. So this is the original team. We started working 2014, and we probably did this on one of the oldest pieces of instrumentation in the building. This is an old carver press, which is over 35 years old. And um, that's led to this era of what we've what now dominates probably 80% of my research group in cold centering. And you can see here some of the people that have um, um, funded us, the National Science Foundation, um, Marata, the Department of Energy through the ARPA program, the Air Force, NGK, Kyocera, Sabik, and, um, and of course, the Center for Dielectrics uh, Studies and Piezoelectrics as a uh, consortium. So what is cold centering? And so I think everybody that works in materials that particularly works with particulate materials knows the science of centering. There's many modifications to this, of course, um, with hot pressing and so forth. But just considering conventional centering, the typical arbitrary material and what you would read in a textbook, for example, um, the centering temperature relative to the, the melting temperature of that material usually ranges between this broad range of 0.5 to 0.95. And, you know, you can push those temperatures down with, with centering aids and so forth. But, um, but typically, it's all high temperature. And in the cases of oxides, this means we're typically centering from 1,000 degrees to 1,500 degrees. And as many of you know, as you change even from 1,200 to 1,300, that can make big differences on the expenses and the costs of your furnacing and kilns and lifetime of those kilns. So we've taken a very different direction. It's still very much in its infancy. Um, and it was inspired by the geological reading. Uh, it's really a low temperature densification process, densifying at low temperatures below 300 degrees with moderate uniaxial pressures. And the key point is adding an, a chemical additive and a chemical additive that will enable dissolution and reprecipitation and also be transient. So it can either evaporate or transform um, um, from that powder compact. And it allows in the centering, the centering temperature to be as low as 0.2, which means that we can even center at temperatures you know, like a barium titanate that's normally centered at say um, 1300 degrees, we will now center at about 150, just above the Curie point. So it's absolutely a shocking result uh, uh, to be able to do this. So just to give you some, some little basics here and just to, to sort of show you the densification process, um, here you can see some densification uh, with some different centering rates. So here we, we've got devices that allows us to look at the heating and the, and the, and the centering kinetics. You can monitor that centering kinetics with a Wolfrey banister uh, phenomenological equation to then extract activation energies. And you can see here zinc oxide being sintered conventionally and we're called sintering. So you're seeing this big change in temperature and big changes in terms of activation energies. Okay. And the parameters of interest are pressure, the chemical activity of that additive, time and temperature. So all the normal things, but in this particular case, I'm just emphasizing the, uh, the heating rate. Here is a more of an isothermal hold, uh, and an isothermal hold of zinc oxide with acetic acid is the additive phase, um, 150 degrees, and monitoring things like the grain growth uh, between temperatures of say 120 degrees to 300 and plotting out then the grain growth under those isothermal conditions. You can see the exponent is around three, which is a very attractive number for liquid phase centering type process. And again, the activation energies for grain boundary migration are of the order of a five times suppression. In terms of properties, you can see here the electrical conductivity at 300 degrees is very similar to the electrical conductivity at 120 degrees, uh, 1,200 degrees. 
And if you catch things at very low temperatures, say 150 degrees, there is a, a zinc acetate amorphous phase left at the grain boundaries after about 10 minutes, but then that cleans out and wicks into the triple points with sequ sequential holds over the next 30 minutes or so. And of course, um, uh, you can clean out those grain boundaries completely if you do the control of closing porosity and everything else um, at, at around 300 degrees where all the acetate phase uh, decomposes to CO2 and CO. Uh, the, the isobaric pressures that you apply, we've looked at a variety of different pressures uh, all the way from say uh, 50 megapascals to 500 megapascals. A lot of our work is around 200 megapascals. But you can see here that pressure also, just to get the point across, that the pressure does have an effect upon the grain growth. The lower pressure actually brings, in the case of zinc oxide, an anisotropic grain growth in the, in the uh, uh, radial plane. And that is also reflected with the grain growth and texturing of the ceramics. And this is the same temperature, higher pressure, and you can see a more equiax grain structure at, um, at these higher pressures. Pointing out that the transfer of stress uh, from the die and from the Z direction where the pressure is being applied is all important to controlling the diffusional processes and the grain growth processes. As I've already said, the important thing is this chemistry. You're using chemistry to dry at very low temperatures to drive dissolution, and that's coupled with moderate temperature and moderate pressure. And even water, so in the case of zinc oxide, has a very limited solubility, but now you add acetic acid to the system. You then change the overall kinetics, the acetic acid and the, and, and the need for forming zinc acetate type um, um, polycondensation in the liquid is accelerating the kinetics and allows then the densification to occur. We've identified three pathways for which a chemical additive can go. And I'll just touch upon these uh, a little bit, but it's all about the chemistry. Okay. And, and I believe that this process is absolutely ubiquitous to all types of considering of materials, but it needs clever chemistry to be able to define and activate the appropriate materials. So let's just have a look here. Um, this is actually a very simple system, KDP. And so here you've got um, uh, uh, potassium, two hydrogens and phosphate groups to make up the structure. Just to show you what happens with, as in terms of a chemical marker, we're looking at um, radioactive deuter deuterated water and then doing TOF sims to then look where there is the exchange of then the decomposition and, uh, and dissolution of the KDP on the surfaces of powders and then the redeposition, re but now with a, um, a heavier um, hydrogen molecule, uh, hydrogen atom um, that can be detected by the TOF sims. And so you can see here then by the imaging of a core shell structure that, that was then created because of that exchange with the deuterated water. Um, you could drive also reactions. Uh, this is a rather dense case. Often the molar ratios and molar volume ratios are not this kind, but here you can see gortite and zinc oxide uh, weighed out in, uh, and dispersed very well in a two to one ratio to then form spinel. And you can then catch a in situ reaction as well as a densification. This is very difficult to do uh, and I don't recommend it, but it's just an illustration of this is another pathway. This route two can also be though used in a more simpler system where you're looking at say doping a barium titanate with a strontium titanate. And in this particular case, you can see here that then you catch a core shell structure around the grain boundaries. And actually there is a little bit of a weighting um, to, the, to the precipitation of the strontium barium strontium uh, chemistry relative to the applied stress directions. And that's pretty understandable in terms of the uh, uh, solution precipitation creep processes that underpin this, this process that we're working on. So lots of scientific details here that I'm going to, to skip over. The bottom line is that we have made a enormous shift in the possibility of sintering materials from conventional regions down. It is still driven by all the thermodynamic parameters that then drive uh, sintering, i.e. the excess surface energy. Um, and it has all the kinetics that you would expect to see in terms of shrinkage and so forth, but at much lower activation energies, as I've shown. 
And we're essentially looking in the temperature scale of a one to 10, and just to put that in a spatial scale, that's an enormous step forward. So Ian talks about, asked me to talk about this as a disruptive technology. Obviously this is disruptive just in terms of temperature alone. Here is KNN, a, uh, where, where, which is a non-lead uh, piezo material. Here is the types of densities and uh, sintering that you can catch with cold sintering, but we don't have time to talk about that specific system. So where, so that's exciting enough, but where I think it is absolutely um, has its most powerful part to the conversation of revolutionizing materials processing of powders is making composites. And of course, for years, we put ceramics and polymers together and we've worked up to percolation in various different ways with fibers and nanoparticles and bimodal distributions. Now we can go the other way around. We can work from 100% ceramic down with about 20% polymer in the grain boundaries and really change the nature of different functionalities with these types of materials. And we haven't done the living materials yet, but I think that Ian is very close to that with some biomaterials. But we have looked at all of these gels and battery materials, semiconductors, polymers, and metals, et cetera. So it really opens up your imagination to what can be done with materials and particularly polycrystal materials. And the most important part of a polycrystal material is often the grain boundary and the microstructure. In terms of those polymers, um, so the very second paper that we wrote in this area was involving polymers. And, and I still think that there's, we're still one of the few groups in the world that's playing around with polymers. And, and a lot of the early work that we did uh, was all thermoplastics, but you can also do thermosets. Here's an example of a PDMS um, silicon elastomer with zinc oxide. You can see here the densification is occurring within 10 minutes and the densities with different volume fractions is coming down, but at least with free volume percent of PDMS in the grain boundaries, as you can see around the grains here with the EDS, you can see the grain structure was truly centering. You can see dihedral uh, uh, triple points with 120 degrees type angles between them. And, you know, the overall densification being very, very high. Um, there is some roughness in the grain boundaries, which is a different story, but I think that's also important um, to the nature of then competitive absorption processes on surfaces. Um, you can also put other phases in the grain boundary. Here's an example of a zinc oxide varista um, where we've gone and added bismuth, manganese, and cobalt. We put polymers in the grain boundaries, which gave us nonlinear coefficients of around one to 10. But we've now got them up to about um, um, 30 uh, in terms of nonlinear coefficients, which is absolutely competitive for conventional sintering processes. And you can see here the structure that you've got then bismuth and manganese and separating all of the things that you need to have in those grain boundaries to control the leakage characteristics and nonlinearities when you then tunnel through those grain boundaries. Working with one of my co-founders of this work with Jing Guo, he, he's now a faculty member in China in, in Xi'an University. And he still continues to, to, to follow up a lot of discussion that we had. He's very honorably then put us on the papers where the conversations were initially generated at Penn State. And here he's looking at a hybrid method where you've actually got oxides in the grain boundaries with polymer, in this case, peak. And this is then leading to some enormous levels of nonlinear coefficients, about 300, with some very, very large breakdown strength. So there's so much you can do. The, the processing space is now allowing you to mix and match materials in ways that we had never really had seen before. It doesn't have to be polymers. You can put 2D materials in. Here you can see some Maxime phases, and we're now putting boron nitride and other materials into grain boundaries just like this. Here you've got some buckyballs. And so a lot of these things can be used for then teasing across grain boundaries, phonon transport. Uh, it can be stopping um, electron injection. It can be doing so many different things in ways that previously took composition and reoxidation processes in the case of electrical applications. We've also pushed it in terms of tape casting. And I know that Eden's group is, uh, uh, has also done this as well. We've, we've been communicating a lot about the best ways to do this. You can see here we tape cast. We remove a binder, we use a QPAC binder system that you can get out at temperatures uh, as 
flows 150 degrees, you can laminate, you can see here, we've done up to 200 layers in some multi-layers. This is about an eight layer system and you can see here the copper uh, electrodes, but, the, but other polymers that were not used as binders are then residual in the grain boundaries to then create varista characteristics such as a PEI, for example. And then of course, such technology is certainly very appealing to all solid state. Is zinc, uh, here, so moving away from zinc oxide, I talked about too much. Uh, here is some barium titanate. Uh, we worked on barium titanate, but it wasn't until 2019 that we were able to do it as a single step process. And so as a single step process, you can see we're controlling nano size grains uh, with a barium titanate. So the starting powders are about 40 nanometers. You can see here it was a, a hydrothermal powder. There's some residual hydroxides that are still in the grain boundaries. But you can see here the epitaxial growth, just like we showed with the KDP. Um, so you're seeing this sort of uh, oswell ripening process going on to then cleaning out the grain boundaries and also very, very thick. So this is suited at 300 degrees. And you can see hysteresis loops and, uh, and high permittivities. Here you can see that the centering of this uh, with the KOH, NOH uh, uh, flux is around, um, around two hours at 300 degrees. Beautiful tri triple points, clean triple points, beautiful microstructures, almost translucent. It puts cold centering away. These are, you know, there's many, many people who have done barium titanate over the years. You can see here a a opportunity to beat spark plasma centering, flash centering, and you're really pushing uh, a different world with cold centering. And here you can see some very attractive uh, numbers in terms of permittivities at room temperature and some microstructures here. So even at 300, it was not good enough for us to put polymers in the grain boundaries, particularly with uh, such an alkali uh, flux being used. So we've now transitioned to a different flux, in fact, even a solid form, barium hydroxide octate. So you've got this uh, eight molecules of water in the system. You cryomill this, you disperse it, and then you can center at temperatures as low as 150 to 200 with some very good microstructures. Just extraordinary, just above the Curie point. Okay, absolutely amazing. And why is that interesting? Uh, well, because I want to put polymers in the grain boundaries. For, for me, the barium titanate was all about putting polymer in the grain boundaries and thinking about local field versus average field. So now you're putting in a very low permittivity material, only a few nanometers thick, and then allowing, because you've got a permittivity mismatch between a high permittivity material and a, and a polymer, too, right? You can get a thousand timefold uh, amplification in the grain boundary, but they're not in the grain. So all the processes that lead to breakdown, like electron injection, migration of oxygen vacancies, and nonlinearities in terms of high fields suppressing the, uh, the polarizability of, of the barium titanate is now completely rewritten because you're controlling local fields. Okay. And so it's actually, we've done this a number of different ways. The most successful way of doing this, this is about to be published or about to be submitted, I should say. And, and this shows you how we break the rules. So we acid watch the barium titanate to create an amorphous titanium layer. We, um, we absorb a polymer, in this case PPO, uh, on the surface. And it basically uh, chemically grafts to this surface. And then we add in the, uh, the barium um, hydroxide hydrate and basically stoichiometrically try and add the appropriate amount in to overcompensate the titanium rich amorphous phases. Then that amorphous phase is then uh, uh, undergoes dissolution and there's reprecipitation and then you get the full densification. You can see here we're driving with different amounts of polymers to high densities above 96%. We've only done this not in multi layers yet, but in pellets. Um, you're seeing here that we can get some very high permittivities, uh, above uh, two and a half thousand. You're seeing an improvement in the breakdown strengths because you're changing the local field. The nonlinearities of the applied electric field is now much more suppressed. And so you're actually catching a much flatter temperature dependence. You're catching a flatter temperature, whoops, a flatter temperature dependence in terms of temperature dependences. And more importantly, the resistivity is being pushed up to 10 to the 14 ohm centimeters. 
the nonlinear conduction processes are being suppressed compared to either air fired materials or other materials. And the time to degradation is also being now suppressed because you're cutting off the migration of oxygen vacancies. So all the things for basically 20 years I've been trying to do in, um, in formulation and in firing and all the other things I can now do with my group by then designing the grain boundary and really thinking differently about how to control the electric field distribution through the nitrogen. So we're already demonstrating relative high permittivities of 2000, tan deltas below 5%. We've got diffuse phase transformations, high resistivities, suppressed nonlinearities of the permittivity, uh, suppressed non, uh, nonlinear, non-ohmic behavior. Um, so we're basically keeping ourselves to Ohm's law to much higher fields and much higher temperatures. And we're also cutting off the degradation of oxygen vacancy migration. All the things that the multi-layer ceramic capacitor companies want to do as we push for higher and higher voltage applications for EVs and other things like this. Okay, so moving to another form of energy storage, uh, the battery. Obviously, there's a big movement towards all solid state batteries. Uh, there's a lot of complexity to designing those. Uh, the communities have made some very good um, cathodes, anodes, and electrolytes. But to bring it all together and with low resistivity at the interfaces is a much bigger challenge. So we are arguing that you can do this where you're actually you know, mixing uh, polymers and carbon in the grain boundaries and sintering the whole thing together with the current collectors in one step. So we've, we've demonstrated each individual component. I mean, this is a, a cathode. We published this about four years ago. Here's some carbon nanofibers around the, the lithium ion phosphate olivine. Here you can see the current collector. And so this was just making some of the great boundaries and designing this and showing that we can push the volumetric capacity up to much higher layers and the thin tape uh, means that we're doing it both in tape and also in, in, in pallet form. And the performance in terms of rates are, are very, are as good as the best papers out there. Um, here is some of the work on electrolytes. Uh, here you can see the challenge even with LAGP was always low densities in the early days and um, um, and the volatility of lithium. At these lower temperatures, we can densify, we can even make them, if you wanted transparency, you can make it transparent. Amazing to take an electrolyte, like a lithium electrolyte, which is struggling for density and can make it trans uh, uh, almost transparent in this case. And then more than that, we can also tease the conduction across grain to grain uh, with optimization of, of uh, ionic transfer. So here you can see the use of salts and gels put into grain boundaries to then maximize the conductivity. Here's an example of the Garnet LLZO with uh, LTO and uh, LFP. Here's an example. This all has to be done in the glove box because we know the sensitivity of LLZZ to, um, to atmosphere. You can see that uh, here you've got the anode, cathode, and uh, electrolyte. You can see some of the boundaries of where we are manipulating uh, gels and other additives to the interfaces. It can all be put together to then drive a very, very low resistivity. This is by far from unoptimized, but you can at least see the directions that this strategy can take. Um, because of the, the thoughts down the road for manufacturing, we're actually jumping away from the lithium systems, uh, even though we've learned a lot from them, and going straight to maybe uh, uh, storage devices that could be done in a batch type process uh, with sodium batteries. And so here, here's an example I've got one of my students, um, saying Gray, Grady is working on beta alumina, a very refractory material that we can center at just about 350 degrees with beautiful microstructures and around operating conditions, very close to 10 to the minus two Siemens. Okay, uh, all done with cold sintering. As we think about manufacturing, uh, we're also trying to develop metrologies for this. We're looking at in situ um, impedance. Um, um, as obviously I've shown you data where we're looking at the densification but we're also looking at um, monitoring impedance where the transient phase and the ionic uh, 
dissolution processes are all changing and then taking us to the final uh, microstructures. We're also using acoustic imaging, which is very powerful, particularly when you're putting polymers in. So we produced, I mean, six polymer, uh, six composites that all looked like this. And then we had one that was all about the same density, but not the same properties. And we found with acoustic imaging, uh, you could pick out secondary phases. So we look both with the, with the uh, velocity of the transmission of the acoustic wave and also the attenuation. And then we're also using AI uh, to then um, quickly try and diagnose the microstructure because in material science, uh, we know that microstructure it can be everything. So these are the sort of tools that we're using or beginning to use and beginning to develop to then accelerate the metrology that could even be used in some cases for online um, uh, manufacturing. Um, as we look at scaling, here you can see some plates that we've made. We've been, uh, I've got a mechanical engineer working with me uh, to then optimize the heat transfer across the powders. Very early on, we showed that you could print on and, and screen print and then center uh, on polymers and on foils. Here you can see some of the sizes and um, um, and you know, there's still a tremendous amount to be done here in terms of the scaling up, but uh, it gives you some idea of where we are. And obviously to go after that battery, the lithium battery problem, we, we need to be able to do continuous processing and we're looking into roller technology. And you can see here some very preliminary data, the zinc oxide. So he wanted me to just also uh, update you where we're all with metals. Um, so uh, there's a lot of powder, there's, there's, all, there's over 40 companies in Pennsylvania alone that does powder metallurgy for particularly the mining and drilling uh, industry, medical industry, and predominantly the automobile industry. And so we're looking with them to how to make processes cheaper and also how to think how to get beyond um, uh, 2030 when the internal combustion engine productions will be severely reduced. So at the moment, we're looking at how to, to consider um, a new process. We're using metal, powder metals, and we're using coating technologies. And of course, with powder metals, you've also got plastic deformation. So a lot of the densification as you get with warm compaction is, um, um, is plastic deformation, but we're actually having that assisted with a cold centering step. So just to give you an idea here, there's a lot of data on here. Here's a relative densification. This is dilatometer data. So the controls mean that there is no special additives besides the commercial process being there. This is an F0, FE000 powder. They're all commercial powders. Uh, these are the ones with these different coatings, as in this case, the, the phosphate coating. And you can see here that we then get a small but significant uh, cold centering enhancement. And of course, this is very much controlled by the pressures that you are doing your compaction at. All right, so we have been now doing, we've actually transitioned some work with manufacturing with 140 degrees in a normal warm compaction system. And we have seen that the transfer stress uh, of the green parts before centering can be strongly enhanced in terms of the transverse rupture stress. So the cohesion energy between the grain boundaries is improving at least up to seven times, and we're still pushing this up. Um, I mean, obviously in the fired parts, you're looking at five times that number or, or more, depending upon the chemistry and the microstructures. Um, and you can also just take this process also from the warm compaction into a centered state, the normal centered state, uh, to a normal firing and then the, the previous cold centered warm compaction process. And these all have superior properties than the normal warm compaction or just even room temperature conventional powder metallurgy compressing. Um, where it is super exciting is that it allows you, even in the green state, to basically get high density materials that you can then mill. Um, there's a video here, which I'm not going to go into, but the technician that was doing this was cheering because he was able to thread and, and cut on a lathe a part that never saw a temperature above 140 degrees. It's quite interesting and quite fascinating because 
it could change the uh, for particularly hard materials you could change the sequence of how you mill shape and and then control the firing for then the tolerances that you need and it also gives you an opportunity to mix hard and soft materials in the powder stage to make to make unique microstructures for strength another big opportunity um, uh, as you know, the United Nations has its all uh, a variety of different ways of thinking about how the planet needs to become sustainable and res responsible consumption and production is a key parameter to that. We believe and we are working towards looking at polymers in these grain boundaries for these for certain applications that, that can be reused multiple times. So we're looking at extracting these polymers, which should be as low as two volume the same, and then trying to get those out and then reuse those powders to then drive them around this process. Um, I can't go into too many details on, on the secrets behind this, but I think that, that it's worth just sharing this vision to you for a, a, a closed loop economy for, for recycling for certain applications. Um, so just to summarize, uh, if you're an academic, it's an easy and fast process to get into. We started with less than a $200 investment because we already had a 50 year old press. Um, obviously, we've got much more sophisticated and built other systems now, but it if you don't believe me, as many people didn't believe us in the first place, there's a chance to actually prove for yourself that, 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 um, that you can do this. Obviously, with the low temperatures, there is a CO2 emission, carbon credit opportunities maybe in manufacturing. It, we believe that it is a common universal method for powder technologies. We have not done carbides, we've not done nitrides, we're not clever enough to pull out the chemistries that are so important for that. But I don't see physically why that's a problem. It's just our knowledge of that surface chemistry is not good enough, but I think it would just take the right people to think about it. Obviously you need composites. There's a, there's a pathway to a circular economy and without a doubt, there is new science in Cinery. So let me thank uh, Ian for uh, giving us a chance to chat about this. And I will remind you of Van Gogh. Uh, great things are not done by impulse, but a series of small things brought together. And uh, I very much thank my team and my sponsors for helping us to have strategic ways of trying to drive this technology and, um, and try to transition it as fast as possible. Because this is. This technology, I believe, this is why I reached out to Ian in the very early days of, days of this. It is much bigger than an individual research group or, or, um, or an individual PI. This, is, this potentially could be transformative and it's going to take a community to make that happen. So thank you very much, Ian, for asking me to come along. It's been more than a pleasure. That was a phenomenal talk. Thank you very, very much. I know I sometimes... Uh, seem to make fun of Clive a little bit, but I do think he is, without doubt, the, one of the finest researchers I've ever worked with. Um, so, I think we're going to open up for questions now. Um, and uh, there's been a few that have popped in to the chat as we have been uh, listening to Clive. So the first one is from Amit, um, who uh, I think a few people know, Amit Mahajan. What are the polymers you look what are the properties you look for in a polymer before selecting it for cold sintering? Um, I guess that depends on the application you're aiming for, for but what, 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 what typical things would you look for? Yeah, so, so that, that is a good question. And, um, and, and, and in fact, my answer to this is changing with time. Um, um, and, and, and you're absolutely right. It's about the application. And it also is about the transient chemistry that we're using to drive the sintering process. So the last thing that you need is a, a chemical attack of the transient phase on also the polymer. Um, so, so um, and particularly as we work, as we're working towards, um, sometimes you're pushing the pH down or you're pushing the pH really up to then drive the kinetics of the dissolution process of the ceramic, that can also uh, fragment and break down the polymers. So, so it's about, so the first rule is to make sure that it's compatible uh, to the transient phase or to modify your temperatures and processing conditions to, to accommodate that. Um, 
in the, in the case of the circular economy case, uh, we're very interested in polymers that uh, unzip and fragment at a monomeric level. So we're very interested in polymers uh, like PMMA, for example, that 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 uh, is well known uh, in in the ceramics industry, but not so well used. But we know it actually has a very low ash content in the binder burnout and fragmentation. And you can also uh, reduce it in an environment that can be vacuum or reducing. So if you've got something that's going to oxidize, like a metal. Uh, then maybe you can avoid the oxidation step and remove the polymer and everything together. So, so, so it's, it's about chemical compatibility application and the net goal that you're looking for. And it gets more and more complicated as you think about the recycling step. Thank you. Um, so on a further question, uh, um, how do you mix the polymers? This is from Fabio. Uh, how do you mix the polymers with BAM titanates? And why polymers in the grain boundaries? Is this related to flexibility? Um, so, um, so, so, so the mixing of the polymer, obviously the state of mixing is, 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 is very important. I mean, some polymers, um, um, you need to think a lot about the dispersion and, 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 and the example I gave for the best results that I've shown on barium titanate is actually a polymer that we use in a solution process that then absorbs to the surfaces and, um, and is sufficiently chemically bound to that surface to then not flow into triple points under the compaction processes. Uh, so, so there's a question of how you mix and lead to the final distribution. Um, as I explained, um, a lot of my thinking is around local field control and not about mechanical properties at that point. Um, but there are some op opportunities. I mean, nature of, uh, at the end of the day uses polymer in, in materials like aragonite and yeah. Uh, and chitons and other forms to then have very stiff and strong material. So um, I'm not a mechanical person, um, mostly electrical, but, but there's without doubt opportunities with the right like, type of bonding to the surfaces, the right type of in-situ cross-linking. Um, there are these dynamic cross-linking systems that you can use as a... As a um, uh, um, as, a, as a system where you can use the thermoplastic characteristics and the processing of those and then take them to a secondary high temperature and then cross-link them. And so they're quite interesting, right? So they can then change properties uh, on the fly in narrow grain boundaries. So, so a, a, a question that is enormous question in terms of implication, but it's more than about the flexibility or uh, impact strength of the mechanical properties. It is whatever your imagination needs, and then designing it around the properties of the polymer and the interface. Okay, thank you for that response, Clive. Um, this is a question guess, that gets asked a lot. But does the cold sintering of ceramics have to be done, be done with applied pressure? Uh, so I think the question to that is, um, um, it, it's very much it depends. I mean, you could you could you could sinter sodium chloride if you had the desire, without a pressure and probably to ninety percent dense. Um, so a lot of it depends upon the solubility and the kinetics. The applied pressure to me is all about the contact points and the non-equilibrium that is developed by that strain, uh, and that contact point creates a local point of where where you stress the the the, the chemical bonds and the powders. And then with the right chemical phase, then accelerates the diffusion. And because the chemical activity at that point is now a concentration gradient, the non-equilibrium then drives the grain boundary diffusion. And so it's, this is all about non-equilibrium thermodynamics. And so the, that additional pressure is helpful not completely necessary, but it's, I do believe it's necessary for even the easiest materials at high density, if you want high density. If you want porous materials, maybe not. 
I think I think that's there are some systems that you, you would imagine can create some level of density. I mean, exactly as Clive says, it depends on their solubility. Um, but you know, we're very interested in achieving 80, 85 percent dense in some systems, as long as there's decent necking between the particles. Yeah. Um, you have a level of rigidity, then it becomes a viable material if you want to have something that's porous. So I do think there is a lot of interest in in, in things yeah. which are not necessarily pressed. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, 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 porous, the, the porous catalysis community yeah. uh, uh, um, definitely could get away with a lot more. And, and yeah, there's a few other applications where you would want to have porous stuff. I'm better not talk yeah. anymore because I might give you give away my next grant application. Um, so, um, so it's, um, next question is again on mechanical properties from Camilla. Um, have you studied the mechanical properties of these cold sintered ceramics uh, to any extent? Yeah, so, so there, uh, uh, some colleagues have done that, uh, and I've complained to them because they tested materials which are 150 in zinc oxide and they were then lower performances. And um, I, put, I complained to them because we know that they had the zinc acetate in the grain boundaries at those temperatures, as I shown this morning. And so, and so they needed to basically make materials and close the porosity at the right time. And, and I can't give you a, a number at the moment, but, but for example, I showed my students work on the beta alumina. For him to, he, he was whacking this thing with a hammer to try and break it and to actually create a fracture micrograph, uh, a microstructure uh, uh, of some of those images. So um, I think there's a lot more to be done in the mechanical space for sure. Um, and I think it's very easy to make a weak cold centered grain boundary by not understanding the details of the transient phase and the evaporation and the closing of porosity. But if you do understand why all those things are important as opposed to just doing it, uh, and giving yourself time to do it, you could actually push the mechanical strengths up. I do believe that they may not be quite as strong as the bulk materials, but I think you can close the gap more than what's been reported so far. Yeah, I would agree, Clive, that, uh, you know, we've had to try and remove cold centered materials because they've stuck very adhered very nicely to the, uh, to the dye. And I have anecdotal tales of my students hitting them with hammers. So to get them and to fracture them off. So you, you, they are very, they can be very, very uh, mechanically sound, um, but also the other extreme, there are some, they're, they're, some materials are just inherently not as good mechanically. Um, particle size, what is the effect on cold sintering? Uh, this is from Dr. Fayez Hussain, who is one of my students, I hate to say. <laughs> well, it's a very good question. Uh, um... Um, if you if you look in the geological literature the, uh, and you worry about solution uh, creep, there is like a a um, uh, so so if you if you look at some, there's some very clever uh, groups that have really worried about sedimentous rock and there is a size dependence um, for sure. I mean, uh, and I think even intuitively um, and uh, um, without even going into the mathematics of of, of, of pressure solution creep. You can see that surface area have, is going to drive the kinetics and the amount into the solute. The driving force of the excess um, surface energy is going to be another driving force for, for, for the densification. Um, so depends on the system. It depends upon the ability to have for a given transient phase, what the kinetics is for then the dissolution rate. And um, um, and it depends again on the application. Uh, I, I, I showed with the barium titanate that you could work with almost micron sized powders, but we also worked with 40 nanometer powders and there was changes in the process for those. Um, but essentially all, they can all be done if you, if you get it right. I, I would recommend if you've got good dispersion of nanoparticles, that's a good place to start because you already have a strong driving force for sintering and you already have a high surface area to then drive the, drive the dissolution step. Um, so, but then if you work on a system that easily goes into solution, even into a water-based material, then, then you could work with five micrometer powders. 
So it, it's so dependent upon the system, but, but you, can, you can work around the volume fractions of liquid and everything else, thinking about the surface and, and the surface area. Yeah, pretty much, I totally agree. We have systems where you can very readily do rocks and cold center them. And sometimes yeah. you need nanoparticles to cold center. It's very true. Right. Um, but there is a general trend towards nano being better. I'm going to skip through now because I don't, I mean, we've kept Clive for well over an hour now. Um, so I think I'm just going to pick out a couple of questions to, uh, that I'm scanning through here. Um, and there's one from uh, Vaidi at Loughborough. Reactive cold sintering, where both synthesis and sintering could be achieved simultaneously. Um, does the chemistry and driving forces help in this process? Could the, he believes this could be very advantageous. So a kind of a reactive cold sintering. Yeah, so, 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 so of course in the thermal world, a reactive um, sintering process has been used before and the, exo the exothermic heat is often driven diffusional processes at those interfaces. I, I, I personally don't like it. Um, I mean, Rick Ryman, for example, has used it in the hydrothermal sintering. But if you look at the densities that he catches there, because you're re reacting titanium and a barium solution, then, then it's, you're, you're basically reacting materials and you're actually often left with very difficult to close porosity. Um, and even in the, the reactive example I had, which was the goatite and the, um, and, um, and the zinc oxide to make the, spin to make the spinel, there, there, the molar volumes of each of the constituent phases were compatible with then the final product. That's almost pretty rare to get that matched up. I, so I, I think it opens up more complexity than, than, than I have the patience to deal with, to tell you the truth. Because I think, that, think there are, you know, that's, walk, that's, that's like walking up the eiger. There's, it's not necessary to do that. Um, you don't have to do that. I think maybe if you're driven by the science of those processes, it would be there, but you've got to get really lucky in, in balancing the molar volume changes that you see uh, to, to, to get very high density. Okay, I'm going to just do one last question. I am being very arbitrary about how I pick this because we are now at the end of the session. Um, and I'm going to ask uh, one question from uh, Tom Cooper because it does definitely resonate with what uh, Clive was saying about um, radial grain growth. Um, what are the opportunities of, for cold sintering of textured ceramics? Um, uh, could you imagine a situation, Clive, where we could use these to make highly textured ceramics to improve properties? I think you probably could because we've, we've already done it and I suspect you've already done it, so. Yeah, I, 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 I do think there's opportunities I'm, uh, um, to do that for sure. Um, we've, we've templated barium titanate and so forth. The, 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 um, I, I would say that that, that, that that is definitely an area that could be definitely investigated. Um, um, the, the one challenge is to make sure that the grain size of the matrix phase is, is still nanoscale. And so off your templates, you've preserved the, the driving force for then the growth of the other phase in there. You don't want the cold sintering to then, because we've shown data where the activation energies are low for grain growth and whatever, you probably will have to do a second thermal treatment. So if all of a sudden then you still have a growth of the matrix phase, then you're going to lower the, the driving force for then the, uh, the single crystal growth to go in there. But um, as we've shown with the zinc oxide, uh, there, are some, there are some texturing factors that can come in even with pressure um, um, so I, I do think that that is a very worthwhile area to study. Um, um, but, but what I've indicated is the early warning signs to what you'd have to be thinking as you try and drive the process. I think in our experience, there's a natural tendency in certain systems towards texturing because you're, you're encouraging growth uh, in, the, in the radial uh, dimensions. But um, there is a thickness factor, a thickness effect. So the upper surface and the lower surfaces can be beautifully textured. The interiors, not so much. So um, 
there's a definite thickness effect to this that, and it needs to be explored a lot more but there is there is a good chance of uh, yep. texturing being achievable but it's it's uh, throughout the body but i think it needs to be investigated quite a lot more than currently i have and perhaps clive has done more on it but it's uh, yeah yeah so so so, so it's the, the age old problem of even the stress gradients um that are present in normal even powder pressing in a dye at the green forming stage, pellet forming stage, the aspect ratios changes the stress profiles. And then if those stress gradients um, um, are not controlled well, then, then you'll see different types of microstructure with the more difficult um, um, uh, control of those stress gradients. So, so and, and and it's also the interaction, not just the frictional uh, flow and rearrangements at the walls, but it's also, depending on the pressure here, it's, the, it's also the radial distribution in the triaxial sense, but a lower stress. So, as you back, so the way we explain the zinc oxide is when we backed off the stress, we saw larger grain growth in this direction is because all of the contact points and all of the diffusion is going in these directions. And that favors an anisotropic material like wurtzite, like zinc oxide. And so you go to a higher pressure, then the biaxial um, in-plane stresses are greater. There are contact points within the plane, which then drives it towards more uh, a more equiax grain structure. So, so the stress profiles and the stress gradients, depending upon size, and also all those all those various tensors and the gradients are critical to understand as you scale bigger and bigger. Um, and, um, and that's where we definitely believe that the pressure solution growth fundamentals need to come in terms of driving the science behind this. And learn, from, was, learn, learn from the old work that people did for even pressing pellets. So that was a very good question, Tom, and I think it was a very long answer of yes, I think. There is some yeah. interest in that, uh, and, and we've we've observed it, and Clive definitely has observed it, and has, has probably been significantly more than we have. But it's certainly an observation we've made. Okay, um, I, we can't take any more of Clive's time. We're already five minutes over. Um, I hope you all believe that that was a marvelous talk and a, and, a, and as good a, a Q and A session as we could muster based on the the limited time that we have. So uh, please. Um, uh, if you're interested in any future events of this nature, um, where we look at these disruptive technologies, we have one coming up on uh, by, by Mark Rainforth uh, in, next month. Please check your uh, all the um, social media outlets for information on that and the various newsletters and our webpage as well, the TIFI Network Plus webpage. Um, uh, uh, and that's going to be on uh, designing alloys by resource efficiency. The title may be a little different to that from Mark, but it's going to be about that subject area and focus more on metals. Um, we'll restart this green, uh, uh, Blue Skies Green Future series uh, in uh, after Mark has given his talk, and but only will restart uh, in, in, in September. So we have one more talk for this cluster uh, next month, and then there'll be one beginning again in September, uh, and we'll be advertising that in due course. Please look to our uh, web pages for further details and further information about the activities that we have ongoing within the uh, TFI Network Plus uh, family. Um, we uh, are very proactive. We have workshops and all sorts going on. So please check out uh, our website if you are interested in the things we've done. And please become a member if you think that that's uh, something you want to do. We would welcome all comers uh, as members to our newly formed network. Thank you very much, Clive. That was just fantastic. And um, I will now close the uh, webinar, if that's okay with everybody. So thank you for attending.